everyone who's got a story will tell you, someone somewhere took an interest in them. Someone somewhere has said, hey, you, you've got a chance, son, you're all right. Whatever they turn to, they can make a success of it by hard work, for well, sure. Thank you and welcome back to another episode of Marvin Herbert's Nothing But The Truth. In, as you all know, we're on to a platform which really helps navigate youngsters away from the life that I used to lead and all the badness that they intend to get up to when they're young. So um, we cover a lot of subjects and we cover a lot of scenarios and situations, but today I've got an exceptional guest on, um, Harry Redknapp. There we go. Thanks for Marvin, coming, Marvin. Great to see you. <laughs> well, my pleasure, my pleasure, my pleasure. Um, now, the reason why I've got you on today, Harry, is because Obviously, you're from a working class environment, similar to the environments I was um, brought up from. But what I'd like to think about is your working class environment had five times or ten times less than we had as kids growing up. Mm. And yet, so many people from your generation have gone on to become very successful people within society, you being one of them. So what I wanted to cover today was just a little bit of your journey, a little bit of your story, and then basically let the kids know that even being in a working class environment, even having nothing, even struggling when you're young or your parents struggling to get you the latest bits or the, the fastest cars or the newest bikes, that like you can actually still go on to become someone in life. Absolutely. So that's the biggest <coughs> message that I've got for the youngsters out there. And mm. it is an honor and a privilege to have you on. And, um, more than anything, yeah, it's people, not so much like us, because you're legitimate, you've been legitimate your whole life, you've done your, lived your life nigh on perfect in comparison to myself. But I think people like myself, from where I come from, with the experiences I've been through, can actually have empathy for other people from a similar background. So I'm trying to create a network where our whole network has empathy from everybody in society. And I'm so appreciative that you've come on because you touch a different demographic audience than I could ever touch. Yeah. And that's why I think it's so powerful having you on. And I really appreciate the fact that you go out of your way, yeah, not just once, twice, about three, four times you've gone out of your way for me and my friends over the last couple of years. And I want to let you know now that I am 100% thankful and appreciative of the time that you take out of your life to help me grow my no, I appreciate that, Marvin. It's a pleasure, mate. You know, I, I met you first of all, didn't I, at uh, 10 Downing Street. Yeah. When we was there with uh, uh, Theresa May was just about to finish. And, it, you know, it was a thing about knife crime, wasn't it? And yeah. All that. And we were there with Mark Prince was there that day. And, um, yeah, I, you know, we had a chat and I just... I thought he's a proper geezer, you know, you, and what a life you've had, yeah. haven't you? I mean, you know, it's, you, your story is amazing and it's interesting and people are interested in what you've done with your life for sure, you know? I've got to say, the one thing I do take out, right, Reddy said to me, you've been, I've been telling all my mates about you, that made me feel so proud. Yeah, yeah. No, it did, it made me feel proud. I thought, wow, Harry Redknapp's talking about yeah. me, what a blinder. But you, you turned know? your life around. I mean, you know, you've been, you've been there when, you, my God, you can tell a story, can't you? Yeah. It's incredible. I've been, I've been told I'm a, I'm a good storyteller as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, you are. So, no, I mean, but I, I, I mean, my story really, Mom, I grew up in East London, you know, and we lived in, in Poplar. We, um, you know, it was just after the war. So it, my, our playground was a bomb site. Yeah, Both literally. ends of our street were bomb sites. We got bombed in the war. I, I, came, I was born just after the war. My dad was a prisoner of war for three years in Germany. Came back after the war. My mum worked in the cake factory over the road. My dad worked in the docks all his life. Um, yeah, we were just East London, growing up in the East End and Bedette Estate. I want to take you back to something you just said then. Yeah. yeah. So you said your dad was a prisoner of war? Yeah. For three years? Yeah. How did that affect you? Well, I was, uh, no, I was after the war, wasn't I? He came back oh, and, right. uh, yeah, 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 but when he was a prisoner of war, my dad, he, and got, he went he on captured in, fr in France, yeah. And he still yeah. went on to uphold a family, yeah, live oh, yeah, a normal yeah. life. Yeah, he came back from being a prisoner of war. I mean, it was, yeah, but it was different, you know, it wasn't like, 
uh, you know, there was prisoner of war camps. I mean, I think they used to end up playing football in against the Germans and yeah, all that. Yeah, yeah. You know, it was like but it's still ca it was, captivity. Right? It was it's captivity still, for three years. From your Absolutely, still away oh, from yeah. home. Still not knowing what's going to happen. No, of still PSTD. Not. Absolutely, you know, so you know seeing not... seeing boys try. You know, he used to tell me a story when they was on these wagons on these trains, like cattle trains, and they were going through somewhere in Belgium on the way to the prison. And there was two brothers, they jumped off and it was a little town where they come from, made a run for it and they, they shot them, yeah. the Germans, and then they threw them back on the truck, bleeding to death, you know. You know, it was, it was you wicked. See horrific, oh, yeah. you've only got to look at it. You look at the young people of that era, they were amazing, weren't they? You, you know, you look at Dunkirk and you watch all these kids, six, 17, I've been to Arnhem, to the cemetery, and you walk round there and there's thousands of graves. They are, it is so immaculate the way they keep them. But every, you, when you walk round there for an hour and you look at them, 17 years of age, 18 years of age, 19, 17, everyone's kids, they're all kids gone yeah. to war. They're running on the beaches at Dunkirk, getting off of, you know, and the Germans are, uh, are buried in the, you know, in the sand dunes with machine guns and they're getting off and they're running onto the beaches and they're getting shot right, down yeah. like they were at a fair. You know, it was like a rifle range almost. And it, yeah. I mean, they were incredible era. It was incredible. They were an incredible breed of people. It really that, was, they really that was. Lot. You know, they went, and so yeah, I was born just after the war, but there was no money, people were poor, but we, it was a fantastic time. People helped each other. Yeah, and this is why I was talking, um, I was talking to someone about it yesterday and, um, the thing I sort of, what really sprung out to me was this, right? We're in society now, right? And everyone's going nuts, mm. right? And everyone's pulling their hair out and people are getting pulled from pillar to post. Society's been split. We've got COVID, we've got bombings, we've got killings, we've got stabbings, mm. we've got shootings, we've got everything. Everybody's going nuts. But there's no solidarity, no. right? Because everybody's got everything. Yeah. Everybody's got all the materialistic and stuff. Everyone's, more, everyone's yeah. got all the food. Everyone's yeah. got all the clothes. Everyone's got all the cars. Now they, they just, they just no. want more. more. Like it's, it's just nuts. But I when I think back, yeah, like when everyone had nothing, mm. yeah, like this is after the war, yeah. right? Just imagine that your whole street has been mm. blown up, right? Your whole area's been blown up. You've got no ass, right? All your mates are living in different places, but yet no one's robbing each other. No, no one. No one's hurting each other. No. Everyone's looking after each other's kids. Yeah. Everybody's watching each other's backs. Yeah. Everybody's helping each other keep clean. Everybody's helping each other eat. And everybody's helping each other grow. Mm. Now, what come out of the war was basically the business infrastructure for this country. People like yourself. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And other legitimate businessmen that went on to start <laughs> businesses and companies and grow. Mm. Right? So the solidarity that the country had after the war is something that I think we need to try to encapsulate in today's mm. times yeah. because we need something to bring us together yeah. as, as a nation, as a people, not just as a as a as a nationality or a race. You know, because I, I see a lot of things at the moment where it's this religion, that religion, this race, that kind of this race. When really we're all human beings. Like Absolutely. I never thought for a million years I'd be sitting in the same room with Harry, Net, let alone room cab. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Walking yeah. out the street, and I went, hold up, hold up, turn around. Harry read that, set in the cab. I'll get in the cab, Harry read that, and I'll drive home. Off right. we go. Never in a million years did I ever think that. Never in a million years did I think I'd be able to ring Harry Red and say, Harry, would you mind doing me a favour? Could you help me out, Harry? Like, the, the connection we have, yeah, right? yeah. so this isn't from anything bad, this is all from something good, right? So, everything, ever since I turned my life around, I've just been linking up with really positive people doing positive things, right? Now, I never believed for a million years I'd be in this position, so I believe now that I have to do all I can to help the youngsters yeah, yeah. aspire to be people like yourself and my my current self, not my previous self, yeah. you know, because the world is bad enough as it is, right? And we don't need to make it worse by upsetting each other in our small environment. So I'm mm. set out on a new agenda to not create world peace, but try to create a harmony and a peace within a society or an environment that I'm from. Mm. You know, because the working class or the criminals or the road people, right, are very angry, right, and they're, they're very confused and they feel abandoned. But I believe that nothing but the truth and the Marvin Herbert mm. have strategies, plans and networks to help anybody 
get out of holes, whether they're involved in sports, boxing, music, sure. industry. We're now developing um, a platform and a network for other jobs, other employment. So at the moment, we've got boxing, football, music, um, building and scaffolding. They're the five exits we have for training and employment. So that network there is just going to get bigger and bigger yeah, yeah. and bigger. And in a few years' time, we're going to have our own colleges and our mm. own prisons, the Marvin Irving. Well, you need someone. It's, it's like every everyone who's got a story will tell you. Someone somewhere took an interest in them. Someone somewhere has said, hey, you, you've got a chance, son. You're all right. You know what I mean? Come mm. and like, you know, get yourself out of that, whether it's at a boxing club, you know, and the kid goes to the gym and they teach him how to box and get him off the street, or whether he's a footballer. You know, everybody's got a story and everybody needs somebody to believe in them, don't they? They need yeah. somebody to believe in them and give them good advice and lead them on the right path. Um, and that's what we're all looking for, you know. I mean, as I said, going back to when, when I was a kid, I mean, we, we had rationing. Yeah. You talk about having things. I say to my grandkids now, they all want the best trainers. They want... We had rationing. Yeah. We, had, my nan had a, we had a ration book. And, like, you was allowed one... Uh, one uh, bag of sugar a week on your rations, you were allowed this, you might one bar of chocolate a week, and that was how it was, but you, you look forward to that. Now when you get too much, I say to my kids, what, what is there for kids when they're being, they want to go, you know, you've took them on holiday, you go to Barbados, you stay in the Sandy Lanes Hotel, you, you fly first class. What they got when they leave school, what is their aims? Yeah. They, they've been, they think, oh, this is the norm. Yeah. You know, when you've had nothing, and suddenly, you, that's why you appreciate things when you get something, isn't it? Yeah. But you'll get it by work, you know, the harder you work, the luckier you get. And I think that, that applies to most things in life, really. Yeah, generally. Yeah. Generally. But generally. you need somebody, as you say. You know, you're working with kids now, I'm, you know, in boxing club, football. Some, hey, you're all right, you, you're good. I like you, you're, you're a good player, you, you know. Oh, really, you know? And that was always my philosophy as a football manager. We all love, I don't care who you are, we all love a pat on the back. Well, I do, I, I, I do G up all the kids now, though, with you, you know. Mm -hmm. I said, listen, don't get it twisted. If I think you're, I'm telling you now, I'll call Harry. And I'll go yeah. on my phone, Harry Redknapp, and they see it come out. I say, I'll call him, I'm telling you. If <laughs> you make it, I'll, I'll make the phone call for you. And they're like, will you really, will you really? Yeah, I've yeah. done it when I was in Liverpool with that young yeah, kid, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I won't do it for everybody that comes up and says, ring Harry Redknapp. I'm only going to do it sure. when, when you know. This kid can be helped yeah, and he can yeah. go certain places. So out of the blue, I might make them phone calls. I don't want to be driving And it's nice if you can help one or two get off that part the wrong way and put them on the right path. We have already, Harry. We yeah. have already. It's just about more. Let's yeah. keep them coming. Keep them coming. Keep them coming. And that's the good thing about what we're doing, you know. And it's um, even Mark Prince, he's another one. He's absolutely flying at the moment, you know. And all the projects we're putting together at the moment now should go nationwide. I'm so happy for the the Kyan Prince yeah. game that got yeah, released amazing. the weekend. Yeah, amazing. So now he's here forever it's now, amazing. Kyan. Yeah, you know? amazing. It's amazing, yeah, he's just fantastic. The barriers that he's smashed through mm. and the hurdles he's overcome to be where he is today, yeah. Mark, is just absolutely amazing. It I don't is. know how he does it. No. I really don't no, know how he does I, it myself, you know, but... Not Might go off to Mark and the, the oh, foundation. He's an amazing guy, yeah, for sure. Mm. But you know, Marv, you've done, I mean, as I say, where you've been and where you've spent most of your, half of your life, and now, uh, you know, you've turned your life around. Yeah. Uh, but as you were saying earlier, if you could look back, you wouldn't have started that life in the if you could have turned it around, all the years that you wasted. Yeah. And it is a wasted life, isn't it, with kids going in and being, it's a you waste. know. Like I say to the kids now, if I'd have known back then, what I would have had to, like, if you would have said to me, right, you're going to have to go to prison this amount of times, that amount of times, that amount of times. You're going to have to get cut, you're going to have to get stabbed maybe 20 times, you're going to have to get chopped with axes, you're going to have to get beaten with weapons, you're going to have to spend half your adult life in prison, and at the end of it, you're not going to have nothing. Mm. <laughs> what That's doing not that clever. Thing? No, it's not. What what doing move, that is it? Thing? No, I don't think I'll go down that road. Yeah. But, like we said earlier, it's that belief stuff, right? So I believed my elders. I believed my elders. So I believed my elder lot with the encouragement and the incentives they were giving me to move forward in life to be sensible. And unfortunately for me, I believed the wrong people. I can't blame anybody for what I believed. 
I'm accountable for my choices, I'm accountable for my actions, I'm accountable for my behaviour. So why I do what I do is so nobody else can fall victim to the same stuff that I fell victim to growing up and becoming a man. Because it wasn't until I got shot five times, losing my eye and facing death that I actually woke up. So what yeah. I say to the kids is don't go through what I went through to wake up because it ain't worth it. Now, losing an eye, losing a leg, being taken away from the family wasn't an easy feat to overcome. Get walking again, recovering, wasn't an easy feat to overcome. Facing reality, facing people, wasn't an easy feat to overcome. But I got through it on the grace of God because I've got kids and I want my kids to grow and have everything that I never had as a man, as a kid. And that's what gave me the drive and the ambition to get through everything I went through. When I got through it, I back to ask myself, what am I gonna do now? Mm -hmm. What can I do now, different? I can't go back to that world, I can't go back to that life. What I need to do now is actually help youngsters not become me. How do I help them? By not becoming me, by not encouraging them to do what I used to do. So mm. now we get everything put in place with the programs and the strategies yeah, yeah. and the network to get the youngsters in, train them up and eventually employ them. But do they know? think what, you know, think what they're doing when they carry a knife and they're gonna use a knife, they could then, not only are they ruining some, killing somebody or whatever they're doing and ruining somebody's life, they're also, their, their life then, they're gonna be banged up in prison for the most in, you know, important part of time in their life. I mean, it's, it's not it good. can't be worth it. I had a conversation with a couple of youngsters up in Liverpool about the crime stuff, right? So everyone talks about being a gangster, everyone talks about not being a snitch, everyone talks about doing bits and pieces. So I've got these young kids. So I said, right, Put your hand up if there's any snitches in the room, right? So obviously no hands have gone up. I said, okay, do me a favour, please, chaps. I said, can every, anyone in this room, right? I want anybody in this room to put their hand up that if your mum, if your mum got raped, you don't want the police to investigate the crime. Put your hand up, right? No hands went up. I said, if someone killed your nan, shot your nan in the head, right? And you don't want the police to investigate, put your hand up. No hands go up, right? Mm. So I said, right, someone killed your, your, your sister's kid, right? And the police ask you for a statement, and you give a statement, put your hand up, no hands go up. So I said, look, no other hands are going up, because you, you're not snitches, right? Mm. I said, but how do you actually feel? Let's be honest, be honest, be honest. If someone killed your mum, what would you want to happen? Mm. Oh, but I want them in prison. Like, so when we actually break it all down, yeah, the first initial reaction is, I'll kill them. Okay, but you're not gonna kill them, so what do you do next? Ring the police, ring the police. They get arrested, they go to prison. Right, that's normality, mm. right? There's normality. Now, what I was saying to these kids is, you lot are not putting your hands up, right? You're not putting your hands up. Right, put your hand up if you want somebody to rape your mum and not get nicked. Put your hand up, no hands go up. Put your hand up if you want someone to kill your kid or your nan or your granddad and not get nicked. Put your hand up. No hands go up. So you're not prepared, yeah? You're not prepared, yeah? You're prepared to make statements to help people because it's your family, but you're not prepared to make statements to help other people's mm. family. So every time someone gets stabbed, shot or killed, it's someone's mum, dad, uncle yeah. or daughter or son. Yeah. Right? So the law makes rules for kids. The law makes rules for adults. The law makes rules for criminals, right? So if you're a criminal and we make an agreement to go and do a crime and we get caught and I'll tell the police what you're done, then that makes me bad mm. because we had an agreement and I've done something bad. But if you're a normal everyday person and you witness something bad going on and you tell the police what's going on, that doesn't make you a no, snitch. Of course not. And this is the thing that I'm trying to get into these youngsters on the street. They actually think that it's their job not to be good. It's their job to be naughty. Mm. It's their job to be criminals. And I just think, you're not crazy. Yeah, yeah. You know, like, we've got to change the narrative with these youngsters because the way they think towards being honest is pear-shaped nowadays. Mm. And it's really, really, really troubling for me as a parent when kids don't want to be honest. Mm. Like, even when I was a kid, we was always honest. Mm. Like, you used to drop yourself in it every now and then because you were so honest and then you learn how to manipulate the truth 
around about 10, 11 years of age. Then, you know? <laughs> and then, you, then if you're a criminal, you become a liar. If you're not a criminal, you become a gentleman. And that's what I've realised with life. You know, Everyone pretends to be someone they're not and then get caught in a situation what most of them can't handle, which is criminality. And that's why when they go to prison, and this is a fact, you go to prison, 98% of all criminals that go to prison end up on Class A drugs, right? And that's something that is nigh on a fact, right? So if you're a criminal and you, you're going to go to prison, you're going to end up on drugs. So when you get out of prison, you're going to have an, an addiction. That addiction is going to help ruin your life. Your kids are going to mimic, your cousins are going to mimic, everyone. and it's just, for what? For what? This is what I don't get. All these kids are doing what they're mm. doing, they're going where they're going, they're making all these mistakes, they're making all these mistakes, and they're ending up in prison. So their life is ruined. Yeah, absolutely. Ruined, ruined. And then what I like to say, or what I like to bring to people's attention more than anything is that if you go to school, college, you learn a trade, or you get a business acumen, and you start up a company, or you get a business, and you find the right investment and the right teams and the right strategies and the right plans, you don't go to prison and you become happy. Mm. And that's a fact. Yeah, yeah. Right? So I'm trying to create a platform now where I create the right platform, the right environment, the right strategies, the right plans and the right people for success. And with you, Harry, and other people, I believe that we'll achieve our goals. Mm. And it won't be that far long in the future no. before we're there, you know? Yeah. I mean, I was lucky though, Marv, really. I grew up playing football and so, you know, uh, my ambition from a very early age was to be a footballer. That was all, you know, and that was a way out. I, in the East End in them days, uh, the, the best way out was uh, produced a lot of boxers. The old East End in London was a big boxing community or, or, or it produced footballers, you know? Otherwise, you went to work. There was that was it. You 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 know you didn't turn to crime back in them days. No. You went and worked in the docks. Lots. My mates left school work. They become dockers or they, but people just got on and worked. You know and didn't really was happy with whatever they got. Your holidays were down to going down to Canvey Island somewhere or going to South End and for a week. I mean we didn't have we didn't know what an aeroplane was or going yeah, abroad yeah, yeah. or staying in hotels. It would be a caravan. We'd have a caravan for the week. You know. Yeah. Uh, but it was just that was how it was. But you appreciated everything. Now, I just think too many kids now, they want this, they want that. And how are they going to get it? And half of them think the, the easiest way is to turn to crime. But it's not mm. turn to crime. You'll end up one way. You'll end up in prison half your life, wasting your life away. It can't be, can't be right. So is it worth being a criminal? Yes or no? Well, Marvin Herbert can obviously... What's the name of the word? Categorically, I can't. How do you say it? Cat Cat categorically. Categorically, say that it is not worth it. So why I say that is because you got to risk your liberty every single day of your life for a price you can't put your finger on. You're prepared to sh stab, shoot, and kill. You're prepared with them actions to go to prison from one day to life, your whole entire natural life. But yet look in the mirror and call yourself sensible, like. Think about it, you risk your liberty every day of your life committing crime. Right? No criminal, no criminal can tell you how much money they made or how much money they're going to make a year. So they can never tell you how much money they're going to make. Right? Now, to protect that money, they've got to stab, shoot and kill people. So that means they've got to go to prison. And that is facts. Risking your liberty every single day of your life for a price you can't put your finger on, preparing to stab, shoot and kill and go to prison. Why? Why? When you can go to college, go to university, go to um, get a job, work, right? Or even don't go to university, get a trade, get a job, right? End up like Harry Redknapp. Do you understand, Harry? Like, mm. I just don't get these people. Like, why would you want to end up like me, yeah, when you can end up like Harry Redknapp? Well, I was lucky though, Marvin. No, yeah, no, no, I played no, no, football. No, I don't like people when they no. say I was lucky. No, 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 yeah, I played football, right. you know. So you played football, mm. right? Now, does it take hard work to play football? No, but you've got the... You, you, you need skill, you've got the determination. Talent, you've got the talent. Yeah, but you need talent. You, you need, need skill. Talent. Most you, important right, thing is skill You need and motivation. Talent. Yeah, what right? I'm saying, but not every kid can be a footballer. Yeah, I mean, but every, every kid has a skill, Harry. Every, yeah, of course. Right. Every kid they, has a skill. Whatever they turn to, they can make a success of it by hard work, for right. sure. So this is what know, we not do. Not necessarily going to be a footballer. Become a good person, you know, just become a good human being. 
don't commit crimes against other people. You know, don't rob other people of their of their belongings or try to hurt anybody. Why? You know, it's nice to be nice. Yeah. It's nice to be a nice person. It is really nice. You know, don't when somebody upsets you, whether you're driving a car, don't suddenly want to have a fight and go. You know, hold you out. Hey, all right. Think about it. Count to ten. After you count to ten, it really wasn't that important, probably. And off you go. I'll do that now with road rage. Get it? Yeah. I'll don't do jump that. out of the car. You probably jumped out in your day and wanted to knock well, someone out. And I should drag them out of their cars drag back them out. in my day. Yeah. And now what I'll do when they beep their on, I'll just go. Sorry. Yeah. He's in it. And you <laughs> laugh at yourself. Sorry, mate. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, mate. That's mate. It, yeah. All right. Yeah, lovely. No problem. Yeah, it's yeah. finished, isn't it? Yeah, done. All that, you know, aggravation. No. It's, just, it's just not worth it, is it? No. Well, and what I'll do, when they bib their own, or they keep bibbing their own, then I'll just give my own a bit of toot. Now, when they bib their own, I'll bib my own. And then boop, 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 And I was going, I like that. I say, can we play? Can we play? No, fuck off. They drive yeah, off, they drive off yeah. I don't bother getting out again. No. This is crazy no, stuff. Them, days are, them days are well gone, they, mate? You know, you don't need that. But no, it's hard work. You know, whatever you do, if you work hard and you, you can make it at whatever you do. Right, so here's a question that some of the footballers that you've come into contact might not like, but mm. one will. Who is the most hard-working footballer you come across? Oh, without a doubt, I would say Frank Lampard. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Best trainer I've ever seen. Yeah. Never seen anyone train like Frank. Fantastic. Sick. Love it. Every day after training, he'd be out there till it was dark, training on his own. When he finished, everyone else had gone home. He'd be out there doing sprints, bag of balls, shooting left foot, right foot, collecting the balls, take them back up to a cone, up to dribble up to the cone, take it past, bang, it, click, do it a dozen times, collect the balls, back he'd go again. Every day. Harry Kane's a great trainer. Look at Harry Kane, what yeah. a player he is at Tottenham, the England captain. Fantastic. Did you player. ever come across did you ever come across anyone? I'm gonna ask this is the mm. plan devil's advocate now, Mike. Did you ever come across anyone that you thought, do you know what, I don't know about this kid? And then over time yeah, you just course. shone through and just Well them just... two, them two. Frank was a Frank was a good young player, but there was other kids at West Ham who you'd probably thought might have been better, but they didn't know his attitude was completely different to anyone else's. He just wanted to be a, he just practiced and practiced and practiced. You know, you, all the great people, whatever they do, you know, Tiger Woods don't, didn't just go out and suddenly manage to hit a golf ball. He pra every day he'd be out there, wouldn't he, practicing. Practice, practice, practice. And football's the same. The top, lot of, lot of, some people got that talent, they don't have to train like that. They, they're just born. But other lads like Harry Kane, Harry Kane was, you know, he was a player that people thought, well, yeah, I don't know if he'll play at the Premier, he'll play Championship maybe, or Division One. Yeah. He's become the best centre forward in the world. Oh, well, Ronaldo, you know, I talked to people at Real Madrid when he was there, Carlo Angelotti, he said to me, he's the first one in the training ground in the morning and the last one to leave every day. Really he practices, works, trains, in the gym, out on the training pitch. Work, wants to be a player. And boxing's the same, surely. It's, it? yeah, it's all the same. You're in the gym, yeah, yeah. You're, you get fit than anybody else. So, after, you know, you've got a 10 round fight. And when you get to that seventh, eighth round, you know that you're putting the hard yards and you're still going to be going. Yeah. And the other guy now, he can't, Failing, he's gone. Yeah. And you think, Naz, and then yeah, you knock him time, out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that's the well, same. I, I, well, is, I'll do that now with the pro boxers because I've, I've got a really good engine. Right, the pro boxers that are going to the elite level, that are not at the elite level, so you know, British, European, not world uh, elite, but world class, right? I spar them and I'll go in hard. Mm. Not like power hard, yeah. but pressure hard. Do you know what I mean? Where they've got to work and they've got to move and mm. they realise that they need levels of fitness as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. But who was the most promising like footballer you come across? As a kid, the best schoolboy I ever saw was Joe Cole. Oh, Joe was I know a, Joe, Joe, I know Joe was a genius. Joe. Yeah, he's sick. I love Joe. Joe's brilliant. Great lad. Did you ever meet his little brother, Nick? Yeah. He yeah. was good as well, yeah, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. He was really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was really good. Yeah, I've grown him since they were babies. I've Joe, grown him. Joe was amazing talent. Cool. He's out in America now, isn't he? No, he's back here. He oh, does he a little bit now, at yeah? Chelsea. Does a bit, but I think, at Chelsea with the kids and that it's bit The of last coaching. time I spoke to him, he was going out to America. Yeah, no, he's, he's here. I'd like to see Joe actually get into, into management and coaching yeah. more. Yeah, that'd be good. That'd be he's good. got a lot to offer. But Joe was a genius, you know. He could play like 
brilliant footballer. Fair to say, I know Joe. I've known yeah, Joe since he was a baby. Yeah, yeah, Joe's fantastic. My little claim of fame, my little... Yeah, yeah, no, he's, he's good. But it's like everything, you know, they... Joe was natural. He didn't yeah. have to, you know, he trained hard, but he didn't, he wasn't like like Frank or Harry Kane where he had to be out there because he could do all that stuff as a little kid. It was yeah. just so natural to him. Natural, easy, yeah. easy, you know. Yeah. But I played, you know, looking back, Mark, I played with the first black footballer. Oh, really? I mean, oh yeah, Clyde Best. You know, I was at West Ham and we had a boy, interesting story really, we had a, it was a boy called Clyde Best. He was from Bermuda. And he wrote a letter to the manager at West Ham asking if he could have a trial. And managers get letters every day, hundreds of letters. You're the secretary, she, she, they answer them. You don't do it yourself. You know. And you write back, oh, we don't give trials, but if you're in the, you know, uh, if you're playing for a team. Let... Anyway, he got in the company, his coach knew the manager and he sent a letter as well saying, look, he's very good, he's, he's worth having to look at. So the manager said, well, if he pays his own fare and he comes over, if he's in England, we'll let him come in and train one day and have a look at him, you know. And what year was that? This would have been about 1967. Wow. So suddenly, there's not, remember, there's no black footballers. Not one. Man, not yeah. one, right? And then suddenly, we're training in West Ham, we're at Chabble Leaf, we've got Bobby Moore, Jeff Hurst, Martin Peters, who played in the World Cup winning team yep. for England. Suddenly in comes this big kid, big black boy. No one takes any notice, he goes out and trains with the youth team. He's 16. We finish training the first team, we're walking off, we're looking over and the first team players are coming in, the, the youth team players, they're crossing balls, they're having a shot, missing the ball, hitting it 30 yards over the bar. Suddenly in comes this big kid. Someone hits a ball, catches it on his chest, bang, volley, right in the top corner. <laughs> Everyone's gone, fuck, who's that? Who's that? See that? We all stand and watch now, right? So we all stood up there watching. The kids go, they miss the ball, they hit the ball over the bar, they... in he comes again, it's his turn again. He runs in, cross comes in, bang, volley again, back of the net. The manager on green was seen this, right? So I'm taking no ruin, he's over there, comes back in. He said he's 16, that kid. Nah, he looked like Sonny Liston, right? He's six foot one, big kid, bit of a growth. 16, they went, no, really? Anyway, they put him in the youth team on the Saturday to play Arsenal. Beat Arsenal 2 0. He gets both the goals. All the Arsenal, the, the manager at Arsenal, the youth manager, is complaining that he thinks he's overage. Who is he? Where's he? But he's got his. He wasn't oh, overage. Yeah. He wasn't overage. Anyway, within. We sign him. He gets signed on by West Ham. Within. We go to America two months later. He's in the, on the trip with the first team. Plays in all the games. We play Spurs in, on tour. We play all the top teams. And he plays, he's 17 now. And he, he was the first, and he had, he was the most loveliest boy I've ever met in my life. I, I couldn't tell you how lovely he was, Clyde. He was so laid back, but he went through it. You can imagine, yeah, back in on. the day. <laughs> he, you can imagine, back in the day. Oh, he, you know, these scumbags. The only know. black man. The only black player. West Ham as well, I bet he got it from his own. No, they was, they, was they, great. Right? they loved him. I really They loved him, they loved him. Until we made a mistake. They, no, no, I'll be honest, he never got it at West Ham. They oh, loved really? him. Oh, no. wicked, 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 they wicked, loved wicked, him. wicked, wicked. They loved wicked. Big Clyde, he scored goals, he was a good player. Wicked. Big, powerful boy, good skill. Just, and what a lo lovely boy. But we used to get upset for him when we go to Leeds or we go somewhere and he'd get, hey, don't worry, he said, yeah, you know, there's no problem. You know. He went over his head, yeah. he just got on with it. And he Came was a fantastic nice boy, but he was the first black player. And what was Look, his name? Clyde Best. Clyde Best, eh? Clyde Best. What's bon second name to have He's called him Bonnie Best, because in there, there was a film called Bonnie and Clyde. Yeah. And it was Bonnie, Bonnie and Clyde, so we called him Bonnie Best. But he was, uh, he was a great guy. There was a couple of other players at the time who came in, you know, but he was the first real black player to play. And uh, he was just, he was a good player and he was a great, great person. And I that still is. keep in touch with him now. It's mad he how much in, racism is still in football. Yeah, though, he lives like. in, he's back in Bermuda, Clyde. Oh, and Bermuda. I still keep in touch with him. He went back, he went to play, he went to play in America and he ended up going back to Bermuda. Uh, but I still keep in touch with him now. Uh, he's a great man. It's mad though, that, ain't it? Do you know, know what always, always fascinated me about the football um, racism, right? Is that most of the firms 
mix with black people. Of course they do. Do you know what I mean? Most of the people mix with black people, but the minute they get on the terrorist, everyone's fucking yeah, dead. It's, it's mad, it's, isn't it? But nowadays, well, there's only one or two idiots. You know, it's not as bad as it used to be. No, nah, right? I don't. I don't see it at all now. I'll be true, and I'm not. You know, listen. If it was there, I'd, I'm not. You know, I don't see it at football very much. One idiot might shout something out, but that's that's his lot. He's out, and they'll they'll find him, and he's gone. I don't think because every team is full up with black players anyway. Every yeah. team now is most of the players are black. Yeah. yeah so yeah. why why the you know? So if you support whoever, you support Chelsea. Large percentage of your players are probably more black boys than white boys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how it is. So if you go and watch the team, you're not going to be anyone giving grief to any black boy on the other side. Better now, though, isn't it? For oh, completely different now. Yeah. It's crazy, completely man. different. So you see the mindset, like even growing up, like when you was 23, 24, yeah, like it, was it all still the same team camaraderie? As it is now, like, is it all set up pretty much the same or is it much changed in that uh, No, it was more, we were more together then because we were all from Great Britain, all in, you know, I played at West Ham and all the players come within about six mile of the ground. So we was all boys together. from the same, yeah, yeah, up, yeah, yeah. you know, same, there were no foreign players. There were no Germans or Italians or Spanish or Brazilians or Argentinians like now. So there's a lot more camaraderie. They was all, so we was all mates. Yeah. We all came from poor backgrounds and we all used to go out and drink together. We'd play the game on a Saturday and by up past five, we'd be around the Black Lion pub in Plasto having a drink. Yeah. All our mates would be there. The music would be going. The food would all be out on the bar. Vi would run the pub. She'd have jelly deals and all the love roast beef sandwiches yeah. and chips. And, and we'd all be in there and all the music of the 60s would be going, all yeah, the Motown yeah. stuff. And we'd all be in there and have a, have a booze up. And in them days, Marv, you'd get in your car and drive home, drunk as a sack. I mean, drink driving was, I know it's wrong, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. and I wouldn't dream of it now, but back in them days, everyone was people used to do it. Yeah. It was crazy. You didn't think nothing, everyone, there were no breathalysers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There weren't no breathalyzing machines. That Mad, was a, wasn't it? No, people would get in their car and drive. Yeah. And looking back, you think, oh my God. But that was, that's where it was. But we was all together. We used to have a great time. We all, we all mates, Proper you know. Proper team come Proper around. Proper team, yeah. yeah. All yeah. the teams were the same. Arsenal would have been the same, Tottenham. Nearly all, all sort of homegrown players come through the youth team. And as achievements go, as managers go, like you've had a really good career managing yeah. teams, right? And you ain't had unfortunate situations like some managers, but what's your highs and lows in the managers? Like, what's your best? Um, would, it, would, it be, would it be rude to say which is your best team you managed or? No, oh, probably I had a good team at Tottenham, you know. I had a great young team, a group of young players at West Ham who come through the youth team. Yeah, we had six kids who come out of the youth team, all played for England. All, all the same little group. I was a manager then and that was like Rio Ferdinand, you know, Frank Lampard, Jermaine Defoe, uh, Glenn Johnson, uh, Michael Carrick, Joe Cole. They all went on to play for England. So it was great to see them kids come through from the age of 11, 12, I, I, you know, sort of, you know, play, I like to think I played a decent part in their careers and they all went on to become big players. The FA Cup final at yeah. Portsmouth. Yeah, that was a great day, winning the FA Cup with Portsmouth. You know, great times at Tottenham, get, taking them in the Champions League was great. And I managed Bournemouth, for, my first job was Bournemouth, I managed them for 10 years. All right, so when, when, when you actually win the Cup final, right, or well, you do it like, what's the feeling like? As a manager, what 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 was your buzz like? What is well, it? Well, it was great, Mark, because I've grown up watching. The, when I grew up, the FA Cup, people, there was only one game of football on television, live all year, one game, and that was the FA Cup final. We didn't have live football on back in the day when yeah, I was yeah. growing up. We had a nine-inch television with a three-inch magnifying glass over it, right, black and white, <laughs> to make it into a twelve-inch, and the cup final, twelve o'clock, eleven o'clock, when that come on on a Saturday, cup final day. The streets were deserted. There wouldn't be a person on the street. Everybody would watch the cup final. Oh, it was the biggest day of the year. It was the only game live on television. And so, you know, it was the, and oh, to win year, it. What, 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 what years were that then? That would have, well, back in the 60s, you know. The, and it mad how it would come so far in I such know, a short period of I know. time. Like. We had no football. And then suddenly BBC started showing the match of the day. They would show two or three bits of, of two games. 
uh, it'd be on for about 45 minutes. Then you'd have, we're going to, today we have Liverpool versus Arsenal and they show you highlights of the game. The cameras were poor, you know. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah. You was, but then you'd watch that and that would be the, un then suddenly we got the big match on Sundays and then we got the first live match was the big match. On Sunday, Brian Moore would be the, and you'd have West Ham versus Chelsea or someone. You'd, so you could actually watch a live game. Yeah. Before that, it was just a cup final. It was the only live game on television. Unreal, wasn't it? Yeah, one Not game. we've got now, we've got bloody all the different sports, now, football channels. Every game. game. And, every and it was different, Mark, but there was no cameras, so like, You'd have people, like I played with boys who were, and they'd give someone a right hand on the pitch <laughs> when the ball was up the other end. Nothing happened, no one yeah, saw no, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's laid out cold, the centre forward. <laughs> a boy used to play with me, a big centre. He'd jog off, and no one knew, what, what's happened to him? <laughs> he's got blood all over his gob somewhere. He's he just give him a right hook. But yeah. no one saw it. Yeah, I remember football when it was like, I remember the football, when it used to kick off on the pitch, mate, when oh. I was a kid growing up. Yeah, I mean, oh. it was like, it was a different, it was, a, it was just a different mindset totally, wasn't it? It was like proper teams. Yeah, and, yeah. So I can even, even being a kid growing up in East London, you know, I grew up playing, I lived on Bedette Estate, so it was hundreds of kids, right, we're all there. So we used to play football and then we had a porter. They were there, they would, they, you had about four or five. They'd throw us off, you know, you're not supposed to play on there, off. They'd take, try to nick your ball and all that and confiscate your ball. And, and we were playing one day and we had an old do a docker called Albert Chamberlain. Albert was an hard man and his boy used to, and he's watching us play in the port. And he went, Albert went, why don't you leave him alone? He said, what arm? Anyway, he started a little team up called Bedette Boys. And we started playing, he put us in a league, right? We're now in the Regents Boys League. So every Saturday morning we had to get a bus, get a train, get a bus, walk about five miles, go and play, get changed beside the pitch. But it, when we left school, every kid in that Bedette team signed Apprenticeships for football, got a pro apprenticeship. Every yeah. single boy, all 11 of us. And like, without Albert, who was the old docker, he, like I'm saying, he bleed, he, he was there for us, he believed in us. We were 10 and he went, no, I'm, I'm coming, I'll, I'll put you, we'll get a team up. And so we all started selling tickets to try to buy, so we could buy a little kit. So we had a kit and we used to, off we'd go. We'd have like two footballs and we'd, we'd go and we'd play on Sunday mornings. And Albert, every kid that played in it, when they left school at 15, I left school at 14, every kid that left school at 15 in that team got an apprenticeship at a pro club. It was incredible to look yeah. back on it. But without Albert, like you say, you believe in kids, you talk to them, you... I am the Albert. You, you're the Albert. Yeah, we so all need an Albert. So I believe life. in all these youngsters and I believe that I believe in you guys, man. Mm. I believe in yeah, you yeah. guys. So I believe that you will become billionaires. Yeah. I do believe that you will be multi-millionaires. I do believe that you'll never go to prison and you will own your own home yeah. and your own empire. And yeah. that's what I believe in, yeah. based on your skills. It's not my skills, it's your skills. Your hard work, your skills, my network, with my friends, my business associates, my network. Look, Harry Redknapp, every, everyone I'm plugged into, yeah, is part of my network. So anyone I can help anywhere on this planet, yeah, I'm gonna help with my network. So when they come with their product, we'll work out whether it's good enough to be plugged into the rest of the, the network. And it just, everybody has a stage where mm. they can get plugged into the network. Yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah. Is that, you, is that you finished from management now? Oh, or? yeah. Oh, yeah totally retired from yeah, management. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm in EastEnders now, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> I'm in EastEnders. Oh, are you? Yeah. Shut up. I am. No. I filmed it the other week. Oh, well, I'm lying. You know, I know what's telling. So, yeah, debut, I had my first debut the other day. I'm in, um, I'm in a series called You Don't Know Me. You Don't Know Me. Coming oh, out on um, Terrestrial really? Telly, BBC One. Yeah, it's out on BBC One just before Christmas. I know the programme. Yeah, yeah that's, I'm on that. I'm on that. I'm, uh, no, I only did a small part in EastEnders, but, a little, but it was a bit of fun. I've done a four-minute yeah, part. Four brilliant. Minute part, four minute and part, I've just, so. you know, I'm, I'm in, I'm busy all the time. I mean, I've yeah. had, yeah. No, I've had my day, my, you know, I enjoy watching the grandkids play now and going and watching the kids play and, you know. But everybody needs an Albert, and it's good. You, yeah, you can... I'm, I'm everybody's, I'm Albert. my youngster's That's Albert. It. And you're, I believe, I do, I do, I believe in them because I know what they've got inside them. I know what they've got inside of them. And I know with the right nurturing, the right mentoring, and the right avenues, we've got the exits to make them become the best things that they can become Absolutely. individually. So I'm going to ask you a question because we've got a, we've got a, a mutual friend 
Well, I don't know. You might remember him, you might not remember him. Um, Cisco. Yes. You remember Cisco? Of course I do. I ain't half forget him. <laughs> you tell us a little bit about Cisco. Right, for, for, <coughs> for the viewers that don't know about Cisco, he's a guy that got mistaken for being one of the world's best jockeys, right? And he sort of manipulated a yeah, lot yeah. of really wealthy, influential people, and he got in places where you would never expect normality to go. And this man, yeah, oh, is yeah. amazing. So I'll let yeah, Harry... Yeah, no, in. I first met him. I, went, I used to go... When I was managing, I used to go into a casino called Les Ambassador in London, in Park Lane. I don't play casinos. I love a bet, right? I'm a, I'm a punt. I love a bet on the horses. Yeah. I bet on the golf, the football. But casinos don't... But they've got a restaurant there that is fantastic. And it was run by Satirius, who's Alex Ferguson's best pal. Yeah. So I go in there one night. We just played that night. We played at home Tottenham. It's about 11 o'clock. The only place I can get a bit of grub is there. They'd serve to about two in the morning. So I walk in, I'll have a glass of wine. We just won the game. Here's Satirius sitting with this little guy. So I said, Harry, come and join us. Yeah, sure, OK. I sit down. There's a little... He's got a little Irish guy there. Yeah. How are you doing? He said, this is Lee Topless, Harry. Oh, I said, Lee Topless. I said, oh, no. I said, you ride for Richard Fahey? Yes, he said, I ride for Richard Fahey. Yeah, I said, you're doing very well. You're a good jockey. Yeah, brilliant. Yes, he said, I, oh, yes. So anyway, he's sitting there. He said, uh, I'd love to come to a football match. He said, I like Tottenham. And you're the... I said, yeah, no, let me know when you want to come. Anyway, next week, we're playing Milan in the Champions League. I said, Harry, there's a jockey outside. He ain't got a ticket. This is now 20 minutes to kick off. Get him in, get him in, bring him in, get him in. So take him up in the director's box somewhere, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Scruffy little word, but he's scruffy, scruffy little git. In he comes, and after the game, he's downstairs in my, in my, we win the game, he's down in my office. Next thing, he's collecting all, he's getting Gareth Bell shirt signed, Luka Modric, he's getting all the Milan players, putting them all in a dustbin. Oh, he said, I'm going to auction he's for the injured jockeys fund. He said, oh, all right, oh, OK, lovely, yeah. Anyway, this goes on. Next thing, he's, I'm in a box one day at Chelsea, Roman Abramovich, next to Abramovich's box. Harry, there's a little jockey outside. He said that they're playing Barcelona. He can't get in. Can you? Yeah, I'll get him in. But next thing, we're in the King's Road. He's drinking red wine. He's eating two tiramisus. I said, you're riding tomorrow. How do you... You're eating all this food and drinking. Oh, well, when I get to the track, he said, I do two laps or three laps on <laughs> the track. I put a dustbin bag on and I run and lose the weight in the morning. Right, all right. Then he comes, Harry, can you lend me a monkey? 500 quid. I've, got, I've not got my riding fees yet. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Me, I'll buy. He keeps giving me loser after loser. Never tips me a winner, right? Can, Harry, uh, can you give... Yeah, my mum's... My she, she's a drug addict. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I just cut. Anyway... About four years go by, I'm, four he's, years, he's yeah. turning up at Liverpool, he's, <laughs> he's got the best seats in the house, he's going to the best restaurants in London, every big game he turns up. Suddenly my mate rings me, he said, Harry, you still talk to that Lee Topless? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, yeah, oh, he never gives me a winner, you know. He said, well, he ain't Lee Topless. He said, he works <laughs> in a pub in Newmarket collecting glasses. He said, he ain't... I said, you're kidding. <laughs> so I ring Satirius up at the Les Ambassador, who like introduced me to him, who's Alex Ferguson's best pal, and I'll tell him the story. No, he said, that's <coughs> funny. He said, because two weeks ago, I was at Doncaster Races with, with Alex Ferguson. We're in the paddock, and I look at the programme, number six, Lee Topless. He always comes round, and I went, all right, Lee. He said, he looked at me like he didn't know me. I said, that's because he don't. I said, that's the real Lee Topless. Look. He went, <laughs> anyway, that was it. That was oh, it. Well, he had well, everybody. Well. He was brilliant. He was, he was. I he laugh. Was, he was. I have to laugh. I mean, and he had some front, didn't he? Do you still speak to him? Yeah, he still makes me laugh. Right, yeah, see, that's what lad. I love about you. Just why I to, and why I want to ask that question, Mark, because he said to me he still speaks to him. I didn't believe him. Oh, right? no, I don't. I'll, I think it's funny. No, he's, he's an absolute to blinding him. move. Oh, blinding what move. What a boy. Yeah. He's funny, but he's all right, yeah. Yeah, I was good Cisco. Old. He was. He was Cisco kid. Cisco kid, an amazing guy. So that's. Uh, Rounding our show up with that lovely little story there. And just to let you know, right, uh, if you think about that story, right, normally, right, normal people like myself, I would have been human with this kid. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> but look, four yeah. years, five years down the line, Harry's still speaking to this kid. What kind of a man is that? Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't think you realise the man you are, Harry. Yeah. And you, know, you inspire me every time I meet you yeah. a, a little bit That's more, nice, you know. And he's, he, you, know, you really do, because... I have to be a better version of me, and you're teaching me things. Every time. Like, even that, I thought, look, 
Look at that. Props where props is due. Good on you, <laughs> son. Well done. But I was never big enough to do things like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, you want to bash him up. Now I want to start yeah. mimicking bits of yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I'll be letting you know what I've been doing. On no, the... it was funny. He had a lot. I read lot. that way. Yeah? Yeah. I read that way. So, um, once again, thank you very much for another episode. Thanks for coming Marvin, on. Marvin, great to see you, mate. Yeah. Keep up the good work. That's all we can Albert, do. I'm going to call you Albert. Albert, 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 Albert. Albert. 21st century Albert. So, we'll be back with another episode of Marvin Herbert's Nothing But The Truth. Stay tuned, stay focused, and stay positive. Well Nothing done, Marvin. Nothing But The Truth.